So yeah, so we're excited about that. Thank you, Katie. She's going to be busy, and she's having a baby, so it's about to get real. Uh, this morning, we are uh, continuing in our series through the book of Ephesians that we're calling Now What? Um, most of you guys have, have been around. This is a series that is all about who we are, what we have, and what it means for us to be in Christ. That is the, the essence, that is the theme of the book of Ephesians. Now, when you read the book of Ephesians and you look at the book of Ephesians, one of the things that you'll find is, is Ephesians is primarily divided up into two halves. The, the first half of the book of Ephesians, or the first three chapters, is all about who we are in Christ because of the gospel of Jesus. It is about our identity in Christ, how we are saved and how we are redeemed and how we are adopted and how we are loved and blessed and filled with the Holy Spirit. It's all about who we are. The, the second half of Ephesians, then, the last three chapters, are all about how we are. It, it is all about how the gospel affects our life as Christians in our everyday life. It's, it's very practical. It's, a, it's, it's really just about, like, here's the how-tos once you have Christ within you. Here's what it looks like. And this is where we've been lately. Uh, um, some of you guys know a couple of weeks ago we looked at how being in Christ, um, the gospel affects our married life. Uh, last week we looked at how the gospel affects our family life and particularly uh, what it means for our life as fathers. And this week we are going to uh, look at how being in Christ and the, the gospel of Jesus Christ, how it affects our work life or our vocational life. If you have your Bible, you can open it up to Ephesians chapter 6. That's where we are. This is the last chapter in the book of Ephesians. And we are going to look at verses uh, 5 through 9 together this morning. Now... If you're turning there, and as you go there, I want to just ask you guys a question as we get started. How many of you have ever read the Bible or been reading the Bible and come across a passage of Scripture or come across a verse and you just kind of went, huh? Yeah? Like, you're, you just kind of read this and you were like, God, I have no idea what to do with this. Right? Like, God, I know there has got to be some truth here that's for me. Right? But my head just exploded. Right? And I don't know how to make sense of this. Anybody? You've had that? Yeah. Okay. That's where we are this morning. Okay? This is where we come to in the book of Ephesians, which means that as we come to this, we're going to need uh, the grace of God and the humility of God and the Spirit of God to lead us and guide us and teach us in truth. Amen? So here's what I want to ask us to do. I'm going to ask you guys to stand with me. Go ahead and stand. And we're going to read this together, and then as we stand, I'm just going to pray for us as we get into this, okay? Ephesians 6, verses 5 through 9. Let's read this together. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. Let's pray. Father, I thank you this morning for your word. God, I thank you that it's true that, that every word that comes from you is flawless. Father, that every word, God, that you give is useful, God, and beneficial to us for, for teaching us, for correcting us, God, for training us in the way of righteousness, Lord, so that we can be mature and complete, God, that we can be prepared for every good work that you have. And so, Lord, as we come to your word this morning, God, I just ask, Holy Spirit, that you would speak this word to us, that you would minister your truth to us, and God, that you would open up our ears, God, to hear from you, Lord, that you would open up our hearts to receive from you, God, that we would grab hold of, God, what is for us this morning. 
And God, I thank you this morning that, God, it's not an accident that we're here. It's not a mistake, Lord, that you knew we would be, God, because you have something that you want to say to us, God. So let us get it this morning. Let us hear it this morning. Lord, we invite you to speak, God. We receive your word this morning. God, would you change us and transform us by your word? In Jesus' name, amen. You guys can go ahead and take a seat. As we read that, does anybody kind of read that passage and go like, huh? (laughs) Do you read that and go like, I thought you said we were talking about something like work today, right? Does anybody feel a little awkward reading that? Anybody? Come on, be honest. Anybody? Thank you. Okay. I think most of the time, if we're honest, when we come to scriptures like this one, we either just sort of read it quickly or skip it all together. Anybody? I've done it. I'll be honest. I'm like, all right, moving right along, right past that, right? That that would be easier, but, but God, what we have to know, has put this word, these words here for us. So, so we don't want to skip what God's saying. We want to learn from what he's saying. So to do that, though, this morning, we're going to have to do a little background work. We're going to have to... Uh, teach a little bit this morning. So I know most of you guys wanted to not be at school anymore. You graduated or you're trying to avoid it, but we're going to have to do a little bit of that this morning. So uh, to do some background work, what we have to understand here as we come to passages like this is that they're difficult for us because as modern readers, right, we don't really understand the context. What happens is we end up giving scriptures like this one meanings other than the one it was intended to mean. We, we, we put our own spin on it to tell us something other than what God is saying. It is passages like this one that, that deal with slaves and masters. And there's more than this one in the New Testament where we as Americans, we tend to read this through our lens of understanding slavery as it was practiced in the United States, particularly in the South during the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, and, and really sadly and truthfully, it was passages like this one that were used in our country to support slavery, even by Christians and pastors. On the other hand, proponents of the Bible and Christianity, too, have used scriptures like this one to attack Christianity. To say that the Bible absolutely affirms and condones slavery. Maybe you guys have read that online. Maybe you've seen that in blogs or social media posts. Maybe you've read that in the newspaper. Uh, Maybe you've seen that on uh, media, news, television. It's kind of been a popular uh, topic right now. But, But what we need to know this morning is that not only is this passage in Ephesians not condoning slavery, but the Bible itself never affirms the slavery we know. How is that true? For one... What the Bible teaches us is in the very beginning of the Bible, in Genesis chapter 1, is that all mankind was created by God and that we were created in his image and his likeness. That means that as creation, we are all image bearers of God. That means that no one then is greater or more important or more significant or more valuable than another. Every human being was created by God with worth and value and dignity and purpose by God and for God. Additionally, the Bible teaches us that God is not an oppressor, but he is a liberator. Jesus, the Bible tells us in John 3, 16, one of our favorite passages in this country in 17, that for God so loved the world, so that God so loved everyone, that's the world, everyone in the world, that he sent Jesus, right, to die upon a cross so that we could have relationship with him. And it says that he sent Jesus not to condemn the world, but to save it. Jesus came as a liberator. He came to redeem. He came to set free and to save. And just as we think about that, you would never start with a God who loved every person so much that he left the glory of heaven to die on a cross for their sin so that they could have his life and have his spirit and have his power and spend forever and eternity with him and then get slavery from that. Those two things really don't go together. Now, more than that, the scripture affirms that this is true. In fact, the same Paul who writes our passage here in Ephesians chapter 6 also wrote the letter of 1 Timothy. 
And in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, he says this. He says that we also know that the law is made not for the righteous, but for who? For lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and sinful, the unholy and irreligious. Paul just keeps piling it on, right? He's really making a point here. He's like, look, the law, the law of God is for sinners, okay? The law of God is for those who are against God. The law of God is for those who are contrary to who God is. And then Paul starts calling out people by name, right? And guess who makes the list? Look at verse 10. Slave traders. You see that? Verse 10. Where is it? There it is, right there. Third line up. For slave traders. Slavery, as was practiced in the United States, was slave trading. It was a free people who enslaved another free people, making people commodities to be bought and sold as possessions. And what Paul tells us then in verses 10 and 11 is that, that this practice is contrary to the sound doctrine of the gospel. In other words, what he says is that this practice violates, it goes against God and his truth. So when we read scripture, what we need to know as a background, even in coming to this, is that the Bible absolutely, unequivocally, undeniably tells us that the practice of slave trading, which was American slavery, is a practice that is evil in the sight of God, not to be affirmed or supported or practiced by God's people. Do we see that? Okay. So with that, let's go back to Ephesians chapter 6. What's this passage all about now? Paul here is writing to the Christians in Ephesus. Ephesus is a Greek city that is under the control and oppression of the Roman Empire. And within the Roman Empire, what we know about it is that slavery was rampant. It is estimated that at this time, nearly half of the entire population of the Roman Empire was made up of slaves. So Paul is writing this letter to a people where many uh, likely of his readers would have been slaves. Now, slavery in that time in first century uh, Roman Empire uh, and in Ephesus would have been very different from uh, the slavery we know from our American history. Uh, it was different in the sense that, for one, slavery was not based upon race. Uh, was not one people enslaving another people because they thought they were beneath them. Uh, slavery was also typically not a permanent thing. Additionally, slaves had really almost any occupation or role within this society. This included a role such as uh, in government, civil service. This included medical care. This included teaching. This included accounting or agriculture, domestic work. And because slaves then would have a prominent position within the culture, education was encouraged and taught. Additionally, then, slaves could own property, and slaves could even have their own slaves earning other income and purchasing their own freedom with their earnings. It was said that in this time that if you were to walk through the streets of Ephesus, you could not tell who was a slave and who was free. Now, typically, someone in that culture would become a slave in one of two ways. Uh, the first way, which was common, was through war. Uh, you could become a slave if you were a prisoner of war. So two nations, they would go to war. The conquering nation would then enslave the conquered nation and make its people their slaves. Now, the Roman Empire was very big. The Roman army was well-renowned. And so what would often happen is that when the Roman army would come to town, rather than fighting against them, many nations would simply surrender to them. And so rather than, than, than be taken by force, they would surrender and abide by the laws and rules of the Roman government and empire. That was one common way you could be a prisoner of war through, or a slave through war. Uh, the other way someone would become a slave, which was common, is they would choose to become one. Uh, another term that is used for this, and actually in a lot of the translations of the Bible, when it says slave, it uses this term. The term is bond servant. We would probably say, why would anyone become a slave, right? Well, one of the reasons that someone would become a slave in that day was to pay off debt. Uh, in, in our day, in our time, you can amass a whole lot of debt. You can use credit cards. You can borrow money. Uh, you can then 
file for bankruptcy, you can default, you can do whatever. But in that day, in that time, if you wanted to obtain property, uh, if you wanted to buy livestock or you wanted to take out a loan to start a business, as part of your contract, you would have to say, if I cannot repay this, I will become your bond servant. I will, in essence, become your slave and I will work for you for X number of years in order to pay off my debt. This is what Proverbs 22, 7 is talking about when it says that the borrower is slave to the lender. It comes from this idea here. You would become a slave then to the one that you owe. I don't know about you, but my guess is that if this is our system today, most of us would not probably have a credit card. If, if the consequence was like, hey, if you don't pay this, you're going to be my slave for a bit. I'd be like, yeah, we'll pass, right? Uh, that was one way. Another common way that people would come into uh, slavery or become a bond servant was to get out of poverty. If you were to come from a, a poor family, uh, you needed to eat, you needed to survive, maybe your father uh, got hurt and couldn't work, or there was famine or economic crisis in the in the land, maybe you were given a family farm or some family trade, but you could not make it work, you could not make it provide for your family, what you could then do is that you could go and find someone who was wealthy and you could negotiate a deal with them. You could say, I would like to be your bond servant, or in essence, I would like to be your slave, and in exchange for working hard for you, you're going to provide my family with a home and an income and with food. This is one of the ways that families in that Day people could survive and be provided for. They committed themselves to be bond servants. Uh, additionally, in that culture, by not being a Roman citizen, one of the things you could do was become a bond servant of a Roman citizen in order to yourself become a Roman citizen, which would then give you a higher standing in the culture than anyone who would maybe be a free non citizen of Rome. So there were uh, incentives to being a slave. There were incentives to becoming a bond servant. I'm not saying that this is a good system. I'm not saying that they didn't have issues and problems. But, but what I am saying is that this is a very complicated system and one that is very, very different from the slavery that we know. And this is who Paul is writing to. Paul is writing to bond servants and he's writing to masters who would have been together in church like we are right now. They would have been worshiping God together at that time. And what Paul is doing here is he is not affirming slavery, but he is addressing how these Christians who were under this system and in, under this Roman Empire were to live in a way that was godly, live in a way that honored the Lord. This would be similar where if today uh, one of us were to write a letter to the Christians who are part of the underground church in China to encourage them in their uh, walk with the Lord in the midst of, of, of an atheistic and communist nation. In doing so, it wouldn't mean that you believe in or support communism or atheism. The goal would be to affirm and encourage the believers who are there under that system. And that's Paul's aim here. He is teaching the, the people, the Christians who are there, how to honor the Lord in a system that does not. This is a good goal for us in America today, too. This is really ultimately how the gospel is meant to work. The gospel is an inside-out work. The gospel is an inside-out work. It begins in individuals. If you guys remember that when Jesus was born, when Jesus comes on the scene, he is born into a Jewish culture that is already being, over -rule, being ruled and oppressed by the Roman Empire. Jesus comes to that people, only what we don't see is Jesus campaigning for an overthrow of the Roman government. We don't see Jesus trying to get elected into office. We don't see Jesus trying to push some political social agenda. Jesus comes, and what it tells us is that Jesus comes saying, repent, for the kingdom of, God, of heaven has come near. Jesus doesn't come and take aim at an oppressive system. Jesus comes and he takes aim at the hearts of mankind. And while people in that time wanted Jesus to establish his ruling kingdom on the earth, Jesus was establishing his ruling kingdom in people's lives. Systems are ultimately made up of 
people, and so as the hearts of people are changed, systems then become changed too. This is how the gospel works. The gospel is meant to infect us so that the gospel will affect us. The gospel happens in us so that the gospel will happen through us in every part of our lives. It is an inside-out work, and ultimately this is really what happened and what continues to happen with slavery all around the world as, as the gospel of Jesus Christ reached and changed and transformed people's hearts and lives. Christians have risen up all over the world including in America, to lead the way in abolishing slavery. The gospel always changes lives, and the gospel then ultimately changes cultures. Now, many say that the early church, as it grew in the Roman Empire, was made up of a majority of slaves and or former, former slaves. And that would be true because we know that the gospel of Jesus Christ tends to draw the marginalized. The, the gospel of Jesus Christ would draw the poor. The gospel would draw the slave. The gospel would draw the, the women or anyone else who in a culture was, would be considered less than. And in a world where there is much partiality and prejudice, in Christ everyone had equal standing. Everyone was significant. Everyone had purpose. Paul says this in Galatians 3, 26, 28. He says, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have closed yourself with him. He says, listen, there's neither Jew nor Gentile. There's neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female. For all of you are one. In Christ Jesus. This is, in essence, what Paul is drawing the church back to here in Ephesus. What he's affirming is what he said back in Ephesians 5, verse 8, when he tells them, he says, For you were once darkness, but now you are the light of the Lord. Live then as children of light. Paul's saying, Hey, hey, church. No, no matter what circumstance you find yourself in in this life, remember that first and foremost that you are a Christian. And that is what you are to walk in. This means that your lives, our lives as Christians, are meant to be very different from the world and the way, way that the world does things. Paul is telling us, he's, he's conveying to us that, that God, our God, that God our Father is not only interested in our life after death, he's interested in our life right now. That, that God is not only interested, he doesn't only care about what happens in your life in here. He, happen, he cares about what happens to your life out there. About the life that you live. And, and so in this particular passage, Paul is addressing how the gospel changes and affects our work and our relationship as people who are in authority or under authority. And so what I want to do is I want to share with you guys two primary principles from the Apostle Paul here concerning how the gospel affects our work life, okay? And then we'll apply some of that. By, by work life, when I say that, I mean whatever you do, okay? Every one of us is a worker. You might be a student, you might be a teacher, you might be a, a stay-at-home mom, you might be in ministry, you might be in business, you may be in the trades. Uh, wherever you are, everyone works. Everyone is in or under authority. The only difference is our pay, right? So some of us get paid, some of us not so much, some of us not at all, right? How does the gospel affect and change our work, work life? Here's the first principle. The gospel changes how we see our work. The big idea here from Paul is that all work, regardless of your position, regardless of whether you are in authority or under authority, that all work is a service to the Lord. Paul says to those under authority in verse 7, he says, serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord and not... Uh, people. To those in authority, Paul says in verse 9, hey, don't get too cocky, okay, and think you're up here because your master is the same as theirs. In other words, no matter who you are or what kind of work you do, your work is to be a work that is unto the Lord. Many of us have a tendency to think about our work and our faith separately. Oh, we, we tend to think that, that we have a Christian life and then a work life. And really what Paul is doing is he is breaking down for us. He is explaining to us that as Christians, there is not a divide between the secular and the spiritual. Paul is saying, in essence, that if you are in Christ, the Spirit of God is in you, then wherever you go, whatever you are connected to, whatever you are a part of, 
God is there too. And all of that is meant to be unto him. What happens though is when we approach work, when we see it, not from God's perspective, we tend to approach it in one of two ways wrongly. On one hand, uh, that we approach it wrongly is we see work as a necessary evil. We see work as just something we have to endure. We see our work as a drain. We see it as something that we should try to avoid and get out, get out of as quickly as possible. Anybody? Ever been there? Come on. This was a common view that was held in that day. In fact, in the Greek culture, one of the uh, most popular stories that was told was the story about Pandora. Uh, Pandora was the first woman who was created, supposedly created by the god Zeus. And uh, she was given this jar by Zeus and told that she was not to, by any circumstance, uh, open this jar. Of course, she does open the jar, and when she does open the jar, out of this jar comes evil, out of this jar comes disease, and out of this jar comes work. The Greeks, that's what came out of it. The, the, the Greeks in that time, they, they believed that, that part of what was wrong with the world was work, especially manual labor. That, that, that the aim should be to do as little as possible because work is essentially evil. Work is a curse. But according to the Bible, work is something godlike and godly. It is something that God gives us. When we read in the beginning of the Bible that we are created in the image and likeness of God, the Bible starts with God creating. The Bible starts with God doing. The Bible starts with God creating the land and the sea with the heavens and the earth, with the stars, the mountains, the animals, the plants the plants, the, the, the fish, all, all these kinds of things God is creating. Then God gets his hands down in the dirt and God creates mankind. God is busy working. That's how the Bible starts. The, it then tells us that we are created in his image and likeness and we see that God gives responsibility to Adam. He tells him to subdue the world, to subdue the earth, to rule over it, right? He tells him to be fruitful. In other words, God says, go to work. Work is part of what it means to be an image bearer of God. This is why within each of us there is a desire to contribute. There is a desire for order. There is a desire for us to add value or meaning to what is around us. Work is in us. Our God creates, our God does, and this means that for us as we work that we are reflecting him. Work is not a necessary evil, then rather it is an image-bearing expression of God. The other view that was held in that time was uh, one that made work an identity. Work was something that was worshipped, ultimately. It was an identity. My work is who I am. We've seen probably, we've known people like that, that, that work is all about who they are, which is why then when they lose their job, they're absolutely crushed because now they don't know who to be. Paul says that we are all slaves of Christ Jesus and we all have the same master, which means that for all of us, our identity is not in our work, but is in Christ. We don't then worship our work, we worship Jesus, and our work then is an opportunity for us to worship him. Paul, Paul says in Ephesians 2, uh, a little bit earlier, in chapter, eight and nine, or chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, he says that it's by grace through faith that we are saved. And then in verse 10, he says that we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works that God prepared in advance for us to do. Our relationship with Jesus, our connectedness to Jesus is to lead us into good works. I like to say it like this, that we are not saved by our works, but we are saved to works by Jesus' works. The question for us then is, what has Jesus given you to do? What has God given you? Are, are, are you a barista? God prepared a work for you in advance, a good work for you. Be, do a good work there. Right? Are you a student? It's a good work that God prepared in advance for you to do. Are you a stay-at-home mom? That's a good work that God has prepared in advance for you to do. Are you a construction worker with boots and a truck and a lunchbox and a tool belt? Then you're a lot like Jesus, minus the truck, right? But but you're, you're a lot like Jesus, and that is a good work that God has prepared in advance for you to do. Are you an accountant? 
Are you a janitor? Are you a CEO? Are you a volunteer or a coach? Whatever you are, whatever has been given to you by God is an opportunity for you to worship and display him. Martin Luther once said that God milks his cows by the farmers he has assigned to the task. In other words, every job matters. Every position is important. No one is more important than another, that God cares about all of it because God wants to use every one of us in every position to reach every person that's in every position. Ultimately, in some respect, what Paul is saying to us is that you don't have a full-time job. You have a full-time ministry. Your work is your field. And God has put you there in a unique place to affect that place for his kingdom. How, how many times has anybody, have you ever like got up in the morning to go to work, right? Or you got up to go to school or you woke up in the middle of the night with a crying kid and were like, oh man, I'm going to serve the Lord right now, you know? Ah, oh, thank you, Lord. I'm going to serve you. I'm going to serve your kingdom. I'm going to express you, right? Has that ever happened? Okay. See, when we see our work through the gospel, it's, it, we see that it's, it's not a necessary evil and it's not an idol either. We see that it doesn't diminish us, but that it doesn't define us. We see that our work is important, but that it's not ultimate. We discover what Paul's teaching us here is that work is given to us by God as an, to be an act of worship for the sake of serving him and his kingdom, reflecting him to the world. It, it, our work then, and because of this, it would also affect how we see one another. This is also what Paul's saying. If we all have the same master and all the work matters to God, then no one is better than someone else. There isn't anyone better. This is what I always like to say, tell people all the time. I don't, I'll never meet someone better than me. And I'll never meet someone worse. And that's actually a blessing. It allows us, it affords us the opportunity to treat everyone the way that God treats us. This leads us to our second principle here. Uh, not only does the gospel affect how we see our work, the gospel affects how we do our work. If we really understand that as Christians that we're working for the Lord and not just for people, then that ought to ultimately affect the way that we work, right? Right? Paul begins here in uh, chapter, or in verse 5, or 6, um, he says uh, to the, those who are under authority, he begins there, and the first thing he says that we are to do our work in Christ, that our work in Christ is to be done with obedience. Paul says, slaves, obey your earthly masters. That's the first thing that he says. In, in other words, it's really simple. Paul says, hey, listen, do what they ask you to do. Do what your boss tells you. Do what your teacher tells you. Do what your coach tells you. Do what your mom tells you. Okay? If you are in a position where you are under authority in the workplace, in the home, in the school, in the church, wherever, Paul says to you, obey. That, that's his instruction. This means then that someone who is in authority over you, like a boss, actually has the right to give you a job description and tell you what to do. And that you then should actually do that. You say, what about if it's something I don't really like to do? Right? What, what if it's something that I just don't think is fair? I do so much, right? What if nobody else is doing it? Paul says, listen, we aren't like everyone else. We used to be darkness, but now we're light. Paul says, live as the light. What if I don't like the person who's telling me what to do, right? I mean, what if they're a sinful person? What if they got tons of issues and tons of problems? They have no business telling me what I ought to be doing. Paul says, I got great news for you. You ain't working for them. You're working for Jesus, okay? He's your boss. And if Jesus asks you to do it, will you do it? Yeah. Paul says, you're working for Jesus, so ultimately then how you are responding to those that have been placed in authority over you is how you are responding to him. This also means that because Jesus is the real boss, the only time that you would disobey the authority over you is if they asked you to disobey Jesus. If your boss comes, he asks you to steal or lie or cheat for him or your company, you don't do it. Why? Because we don't disobey Jesus. 
Our goal, our aim, is to live in him and walk in his way in a way that glorifies him and puts him on display to the world. So Paul says, if you're under authority, obey. Secondly, Paul says that we are to do our work in Christ with honor. If you're a worker, Paul says, work with honor. He says, in verse 5 again, he says, obey your earthly masters with fear and respect. What that is really meaning for us there is, is work with honor. Paul would say later in 1 Timothy 6, 1, let all who are under a yoke as bondservants regard their own masters as worthy of all honor. We, today, we don't live in an honor culture. We, we live in a time and in a culture where it's popular to dishonor. We live in a time and a culture where our leaders and our authorities are most often the punchline of jokes, right? Even on national television, right? They're, they're, they're made to be a joke of, right? We are more quick to, to be critical of our leaders than we are to esteem and respect them. To show honor essentially means to lift up. To show honor means you lift up. You lift up your boss. You lift up your teachers. You lift up your parents. You lift up your coaches. You lift them up, not only by obeying them, by doing what they ask you to do, but you obey them with, or, or you honor them with your words. You honor them in the way that you talk to them, and you honor them in the way that you talk about them. Most people like to complain about their jobs. Most people like to complain about their boss. It's common for us as people, right, to share with other people about what is wrong with our job. Oh, my job. Oh, man, there's, I, can't, I can't even believe those people. They do it like this, right, whatever it is. Or to complain about our boss. He's so this. She's so that. They know nothing, right? They know nothing. I don't even know how they got that job. Everyone knows more than they do. The guy who started last week knows more than they do, right? We all, we're better than them. We're smarter than them. We know more than them. We're better looking than them, right? We, we got everything. And while most of us would never say it to their face, a lot of us will say it to other people or post it on social media or whatever. Paul, the Bible tells us in Philippians 2.14, it says to us, listen, do everything without grumbling or arguing. Do everything. Do your work. Do your schoolwork. Do your chores. Do everything without complaining about it or arguing about it. Instead, Paul says in Ephesians 4.29, he says, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as it is good for building up, as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. In other words, the words that are supposed to be coming out of our mouth are words that are building up and not tearing down, are words that are gracious and not words that are harsh. Are you honoring those in authority over you with your words? Are you honoring them when you're with them? Are you honoring them when you're not? Now, what about if your boss or your teacher, or your parents are really difficult? Or if they're really challenging? What if they're just hard to be around? You know what you do is you pray for them. That's what you do. Not, not the like, Lord, I pray they get hit by a bus prayer, right? So I don't have to deal with them prayer. The, the kind of prayer that Paul talks about in 1 Timothy 2 when he says, pray for all people and ask God to help them intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. He says, pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. Paul says, in essence, listen, pray for your boss. Pray for those in authority over you. Ask God to help them lead you and lead others. Don't just pray for them. Thank God for them. Have you ever thanked God for your boss? Have you ever thanked God for those who are in authority over you? I'll tell you something that's crazy. If you want to see your heart and your attitude change for a difficult person in your life, start thanking God for them. It'll be amazing. Start blessing their life. Start taking them before the Lord and say, God, I thank you so much for this person. And God, I ask you to bless their life. What you're going to find is that your life's going to change. And you're going to be better, even if they're not. Here's the third thing Paul says. We do our work in Christ with excellence. Verse 5, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart. Now that word sincerity in the Greek is two words, which uh, are, comes from the word sin, which means without or sin. And the word Sarah, which means wax. So it means without wax. That makes sense, right? That's good. Let me explain that. In the first century, when someone would make pottery, 
uh, um, and they would make pottery to sell that pottery, it would be oftentimes happen where pottery would get cracks in it. And so to, to fill that in and be able to sell that piece, they would use wax to fill in the cracks, and then they would paint over that. And you could tell it if you held that piece of pottery up to the light to see that it had cracks. Now, if it didn't have cracks, if it was a, a piece of pottery that was made without cracks, if it was made with this excellence, there would be a stamp placed on it that would say sincera, without wax. What Paul is saying here is that whatever work you do, do it with sincerity. Do it with excellence. Even though you might be in an unjust situation, even though you might have a difficult boss, even though you might have challenging people around you and the world says that you are completely justified to do just a little bit of work and do some really shoddy work, right? But Paul says, listen, we as believers, because we're different, we walk through that door and we do our work with sincerity. We do it with our excellence because we're doing it for Jesus. We don't give... Jesus anything less than our best. So he says, give your best, give your most, give your all, whatever job you have, right? If you're a teacher, teach with excellence. Like Jesus is your student. Right? If, you're, if you're building a home, right? Build that house like it's Jesus' house. Jesus is going to live in that house and you're just, it's going to be excellent, right? You work at McDonald's, you make a Big Mac for Jesus, right? Jesus is going to eat that Big Mac, and you want it to be good, right? If you volunteer, serve with excellence as if you are serving Jesus, because in reality you are. We as Christians should be known for our work, for our good work, for our faithful work, for our quality of work. Are you serving and working with sincerity? Are you working with excellence? Do you work hard and give your best. Here's the, the last thing Paul says to us under authority here. He says, we do our work in Christ with integrity. Look at verse 6. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. I integrity means that you do the same thing when you're alone that you do when you're with people. You, you do what is right regardless of who is watching. Paul says that we're not two different kinds of people. We're not meant to be a people who only do our work when we're being watched. And then when our boss leaves, it just turns into an episode of The Office, right? It's just playing around and goofing and, and all crazy, right, in there? Okay, but Paul, Paul says that it doesn't matter if that's how everyone else does it. It doesn't matter if other people take advantage. It doesn't matter if other people don't really work. We are different, he's saying. We work with excellence. We work with integrity. Are, are we those people who work when our boss is watching and then don't work when they are not? Are we those people that are stealing time from our employers? We're billing for hours that we don't really work. We're really just playing around on the internet and talking to friends, right? Are you taking things from your work that you didn't ask for? Maybe you just figure, well, I, I deserve this. I work hard. Are you turning in receipts for things or personal things or manipulating corporate accounts for reimbursements or whatever it might be, right? What Paul's saying is that if, you, if this isn't something that you would do if Jesus was your boss, don't do it with your boss. Jesus, if you're working for Jesus, you're not going to try and cheat Jesus. So if your boss isn't looking... It doesn't really matter because Jesus is your boss and he's always looking. And Jesus wants our work to be an act of worship. He wants our work to be the will of God for us to do it wholeheartedly and honestly and fairly and with integrity. Our work, like I was saying, our work is our witness. You realize that you probably spend half of your life at work. For some of you, that might seem sad. For God, he sees that as a great opportunity. That's a great opportunity for you then to be a witness for the Lord there. And what your work is producing, the way that you're working, the way that you are is telling people more about what you really believe about God and who he is more than what your words are saying to them. We're different. I'll tell you, I would love to get to a place uh, where when there was a, a company that was opening up positions um, in the area, they would call us up and they'd be like, can you send some Christians over here? Right? They are amazing. 
right? They are amazing. They work so hard. They, they work like Jesus is their boss. They work with honor and integrity. They're trustworthy, right? This is what we're after. Now, Paul also speaks to those in authority, the bosses and leaders. In verse 9, he says, Listen, masters, you treat your slaves in the same way. You don't threaten them since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and there's no favoritism with him. Paul says, treat your slaves in the same way. What is the same way? The, the same way is the, in the same way that those who are under authority are to treat you. So Paul says, really, to masters, it's to be the same. You treat them with honor. You treat them with respect. You do your work with integrity. You do your work with honor, right? You treat those who are under your authority the same way that Jesus treats you being over you. Ultimately, what he's saying is that every boss who is a Christian has a boss named Jesus. All of us work for Jesus. That's, that's the mindset that Paul is trying to to get us here. I don't have time to get into all of this, but, but what he's saying is that we all have the same master so that if you're a leader, you don't get to say, I do less. And if you're under authority, you don't get to say, well, I get to do less. God says to you, you're all my people. You're all, you all belong to me. And whether you're in authority or under authority, I want you to conduct yourselves in a way that is godly. I want you to conduct yourselves in a way that honors me. I want you to represent me. I want your work to be an act of worship to me. Essentially what he's saying to the church is he's saying, church, dare to be different. He's saying, church, dare to step out and be different. Do your work with obedience. Do your work with excellence. Do your work with honor. Do your work with integrity. Because that honors the Lord. And it's him that we as Christians ultimately work for. I'm going to have Corey come up. I'm just going to close this. There's a lot of things that could get at here this morning. But it would take a long time. Here's the last thing though. Here's the last thing that, that, that Paul talks about here. Um, and he talks about it in verse 8. And ultimately what he says is that all our work is rewarded. In verse 8, he says that you know the Lord will reward everyone for whatever good he does, whether slave or free. Paul says, I want you guys to know that even if no one else sees it, I do. Even if no one else knows, I do. Even if it doesn't seem like anyone else is keeping an account, I'm keeping an account and I'm going to reward you for the work that you do. Now that work, that reward comes a different way. Sometimes that reward is external, right? Sometimes that reward is you get the promotion, you get the raise, you get the award, you get the congratulations, you get your name on whatever, right? Like it is an external reward. Oftentimes though, the reward is an internal reward. Oftentimes the reward is that I get the joy of the Lord, that I get the peace of the Lord. That and I go to bed at night and I sleep soundly because my conscience is clear. You, you want to know what a clear conscience is worth? It's priceless. Right. Paul's saying that sometimes it's external. You get a reward. It might be external. It might be internal, right? You're growing. You're maturing. You're becoming more like Christ, okay? But whether it's external, whether it's internal, ultimately the reward will always be eternal. There, there's a reward for all of us in Christ who do good work in heaven. Paul's saying that, that we do our work as if we're working for Jesus because we are and the rewards that we're after are not ultimately the reward that we're going to get here on the earth but the reward that awaits us in eternity with him forever. And I don't know about you because it's hard for us to grab hold of that in our lifetime here but, but a, a reward that lasts for a lifetime or a reward that lasts for an eternity I'd take the eternal one. It's a better reward. It's a better return on your investment. There's not an investment in this lifetime that's an eternal investment and an eternal reward. This is it. And Paul's invitation, he says, listen, if you're under authority, you're in authority, you're not better, you're not worse. We all work for Jesus. And we want to do that work in a way that brings him the most glory possible and puts him on display in the greatest way possible. And that's his invitation. Would you guys stand with me? I'm going to close this. I 
Our prayer for us is that we can receive that this morning. That, that we can receive God's word to us and his invitation to us to work in a way that honors him. That ultimately that we would know in our heart of hearts that, that when Jesus says that, that there is a reward to us, that we actually believe him for it and we live as if that's true. So I just want to pray for us this morning that we would be those people, that we would be that light in the world. You guys pray with me. Father, God, I thank you for every person here. God, I thank you for every work here. God, there is a work that you are doing in every single person's life. And there is a work that you are doing from every single person's life. God, I pray that for every single one of us, God, for those of us who are in you, God, for those of us who would say that, that we belong to you, God, that our work would be done in such a way, God, that it would bring you glory. God, that it would be done in such a way, God, that people would see you, God, because of it. Lord, would you give us the grace, Lord, to do that, God? Would you just work in our hearts, Lord God, uh, to let us and make us, God, those, those people, Father, who, who do our work with honor, God, to be a people who do our work with excellence, to be a people, God, who do our work with integrity, God. Lord, will we, may we be those kinds of people, Lord, light in the world, salt in the world, Lord God. A city on a hill, God, that cannot be hidden. So, Lord, I just bless every single person in here, God. I bless their work, Lord. I pray that by your spirit, God, that you would cause us to see our work as yours. God, that we would see the works that we do as works that belong to you. Jesus, that we would see you being our boss. And God, that our aim in every single thing, God, in every single way, God, would be to worship and praise your name. So, Lord, have your way in us this morning. God, have your way through us. In Jesus' name.